please don't call this a chicken. It's more than that. It's a capon. And if you're Italian, you know exactly what a capon is. It's a castrated rooster. And I got this one here in the Piedmont from a little town called Morozzo, where they take capon very seriously. So seriously that there is a consortium that oversees the raising of these birds, what they eat, how long they live, so on and so on. This is a very tasty bird. And when I was a kid at home, and even till today, this is the bird that we ate at Christmas time, Thanksgiving, and other occasions during the year. So if you've never had a capon, you've got to try it. Here's a tip for keeping any green vegetable green. First of all, start in a big pan. Use a lot of water so that those vegetables are able to circulate around in it. When they're cooked to your satisfaction, use a scoop or strainer to get them shake off the excess water. Then you want to have a bowl of ice water ready. You put them right into the ice water. Let them sit there for a few minutes. Then they will look just like that. Sometimes you need just a little peace and quiet. I am standing in front of the Palazzo Ducale in Gubbio. This is one of my favorite towns, favorite medieval towns. The architecture is absolutely fantastic. Years ago, I came here to film a festival called La Festa dei Ceri. It's the race of the candles. And this square is filled with people. There's nowhere to move. Confetti is flying, red, blue, white. Three saints come out of this palazzo atop huge missile-like candles, and then the race begins. Portofino, beautiful. It's uh, where a lot of tourists love to come. It's a beautiful day, a little bit windy today, and I'm just here to take in the sights, see what's up, and of course, eat. The Via Roma. We're on the Via Roma. I see a Grimaldi, ooh, a Grimaldi jewelry shop. I wonder if that's related to the real Grimaldi family. And I'm looking particularly for focaccia, because this area is known for focaccia, all of Liguria, actually. One of the things you come to Liguria for, of course, is the food. And you would think it would be a seafood culture, but you know, it really isn't. Um, the sea is not that friendly to Liguria. You find a lot of rabbit here. But one thing for sure you're going to find is focaccia. And here we have pasticceria, panficcio, which means a bad story. It sells all kinds of focaccia. So it's a speciality for Liguri. And you have focaccia alla genovese, which is the classic one with the Ligurian olive oil, water, and little dimple tops. And when you put it in the oven, all of that oil seeps into the little crevices. Delicious. Then you have 
a focaccia with onion, chipotle. Then you have a focaccia with olives. Then you have a focaccia with cheese, al formaggio. Then you have farinata cecina. Farinata is like a, a baked chickpea pie in the oven. And then you have panettone alla genovese, which is a sweet bread, usually has candied fruit in it, similar to the one that you find in um, Milano. So that's what you want to eat when you come to Liguria. Two typical pastas of Liguria are corzetti, meaning little coins, stamped. I don't know if you can see the design on that. This is usually served with a marjoram sauce, and we're going to be making those, and you can get the recipe for those on chowitalia.com. And then troffier. Troffier are these tiny little, look at how thin they are, pasta, dried pasta that is combined with pesto. Of course, pesto is the classic sauce here in Liguria. So two classic pastas, corzetti, meaning little stamp, and troffier, which is their gnocchi. So I'm on my way to Monarola, but I really think this is such a mad majestic view that you should take it all in. Want to go for a ride in my boat? All along this avenue, this via, are these boats all lined up as if somebody had parked their car. <laughs> Let me give you a tip. If you want to bring something home from the regions and the towns that you visit, don't buy trinkets. Buy spices. These are typical of the ones you'll find. Here's some rosemary. Now, I, I prefer to use fresh herbs. But I'm showing you that these are some of the herbs that you find in Liguria. They particularly like marjorana. Marjorana is used in sauces. Um, you've got thyme, timo. You've got salvia, which is sage. What else do we have here? More salvia. And then you have spices in a package. These are always fun to bring home to people. This is for if you want to make a sauce for a, a very... Uh, flavorful and kind of uh, hot spaghetti. So you would add these dried hot red pepper flakes. There's some nice looking spices here. So, you remember, you have to remember that of course Genoa, we're very close to Genoa, was a major port, one of the four maritime ports of Italy. And of course, spice trade came through there. So this makes a lot of sense. So uh, I may come back and get some of that later. Kind of a feast for the eyes, isn't it? Look at all the different pastas. Here. So the corzetti, we made those in the class with the students, if you remember, if you were paying attention. And here, limoncello. That would be nice to bring home. We'd have to wrap that really well, though. What do we got here? Cookies. Amaretti. Soft amaretti. Oh, made with shakatra. Shakatra is a really delicious, sweet dessert wine. Shakatra. It's a dialect word. <sighs> Look at all these. Now, there it is right here, the Chakatra. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Today I'm high in the hills here in uh, Umbria. And the reason I'm here is because we're looking for black truffles. So how do you get a truffle? You've got to use a dog, and you've got to use a dog that's been trained from a very early age to sniff out what does a truffle smell like. Goes, dogs go through a lot of training for this. Traditionally in the past, they used pigs to find truffles, but of course the pigs finally figured out that the truffles were as good to eat as humans knew they were good to eat, so that went by the wayside. Dogs, however, do not eat the truffles. So you come out into the woods, and usually it's a very secret place because there's a lot of competition between truffle hunters and their dogs. And how do you eat a black truffle? Well, you really never cook with it. All you really want to do is shave it or grate it, and then you want to slightly just warm it in a little bit of olive oil, but you would really never cook with it. So it's more like a, a condimento. And how would I describe the flavor? It's very difficult to describe. I just have to say that it has the flavor 
of the forest. I mean, it's, you really have to taste it yourself. So it commands a lot of money on the marketplace. You find truffles in a lot of the uh, recipes that you see here uh, in Umbria, for instance, spaghetti with a little truffle sauce, or you might have truffles over bruschetta, but you really would not cook with them per se. So if you are ever lucky enough to have a truffle, and there goes Linda, our little truffle dog here who has been trained to sniff them out. You see, she's looking. She is looking very diligently, and hopefully she's going to find something. And her owner is going to reward her with a little biscottino. She knows a secret that we don't know. in the garden and that means it's time for lettuce because guess what lettuce is a cool weather crop it's one of the first things that comes out of your garden and an Italian meal without a salad unthinkable yep unthinkable so we have a variety of lettuces that we plant every year in the Chow Italia garden I'll give you a little tour so here we have something called Lola Rossa Lola Rosa, meaning red Lola, because of course it's a beautiful red leaf lettuce. Isn't that beautiful? Because in a salad bowl, you want to have a variety of lettuces. You just don't want to have one. That's so boring. You can get a lot of different textures, tastes, flavors. So Lola Rosa is a, a new one this year, actually. And then the cousin to Lola Rosa is this one here, Lola Bionda. In other words, blonde. A Lola. And then down here we have one of my favorites with a beautiful name, Canary Tongues, Lingua di Canarino, with this nice sawtooth looking lettuce. That's another reason to plant a variety of lettuces because you have different looks to the, to the leaves and that makes it really interesting as well. This is something called freckles and it's called freckles because it has all those little little red spots all over it. These lettuces look like bridal bouquets, don't they? Beautiful, so we're gonna take that one. So I'm gonna leave that here and finish this tour for you. Then we have here, beautiful bib lettuces. Look how pretty they are, and they're just starting to head up. And we're gonna make some unique Italian salads for you in the kitchen, so you and I need to go nella cucina for insalata italiana. <music> Lola Rosa from Guy's Garden. Brussels sprouts are a favorite for Thanksgiving. And when I get them, I get them on the stalk because they are very, very fresh. And you can buy them like this in your grocery store or at your farmer's market. And you just snip them off 
and I like to roast them. And you can find recipes for Brussels sprouts on the Chow Italia website. So make this one of the sides for Thanksgiving. Here's a head of cauliflower. I want to take out this core. And the easiest way to do it is to turn it upside down, take a knife, and go right down between the edges of the core. And you'll see what happens here. The florets just fall away. And that's the easy way to take out the core. Get the recipe for these delicious Bailey's Irish Cream flavored macaroons. The recipe is on ChowItalia.com. They go together in minutes, they taste delicious, and they're perfect for the holidays.
all over Italy you can discover treasures. And here's one right on the wall of the church of Sant Pantaleone, which happens to be a church in Ravello, the beautiful town of Ravello, which is noted for its music. And on the wall of this church we have a remnant left of a mosaic. And at one time, this entire church was covered with this type of mosaic. But then as time passed and workers came in here to refurbish the church, they, through no fault of their own, actually destroyed many of the frescoes and the mosaics that were here in this church. So whenever you see something like that, you discover a little piece of history like that. It's always a wonderful reminder that uh, Italy is just full of hidden art treasures. But while they were restoring this church, they did manage to save some wonderful pieces, including the pulpit, which you see here that has Byzantine elements to it, romantic elements to it. And actually, when I look at the lions, I'm reminded very much, this pulpit is very much like the one in Pisa, if you've ever been in the cathedral at Pisa. So that must have been a wonderful revelation when they were restoring the church and came upon the pulpit that you see there that is so richly decorated and was paid for by the uh, Rudolfo family. This one was the one in Caracotta. This one, what we're actually stepping on is the new one. But you do notice that, that the floor has a rising, uh, um, has an incline going to the old cathedral, the Bay of Now here we have two pulpits. This one is the Bay of uh, uh, Council, or pulpit, which is represented with the eagle by Rufo's family. with this heavy Baroque decoration of chapel. 1932, they were undergoing two hands, when not a lot, the, the persons, the contractors hired the work, uh, near the side of the chance, and fragments remaining of precious that once would have been decorated. For almost 200 years, the people of Naples saw the church of Santa Chiara, but not the secret garden hidden behind it. The only ones who saw this beautiful cloistered garden were the sisters of St. Clair, who lived in complete seclusion from the outside world. But the outside world was not shut out to them at least in the hundreds of creative scenes captured onto Majolica tiles by landscape architect Domenico Vaccaro. In 1729, the convent abbess commissioned Vaccaro to create, quote, a garden suitable for the decorum of noble ladies. And while the Carl's garden design was traditional, geometric, and suitable, his tile decoration designs for the pillars and benches was wildly Neapolitan, filled with blazing suns, ripe lemons, blue skies, and scenes from modern-day Neapolitan life, as lived by peasants and princes alike. All of this beauty remained a secret, seen only by the nuns until 1924, when they moved to another convent, and the Franciscan friars came here. Soon after, they opened the garden to the public. Only in Naples will you find such a masterpiece of Neapolitan life, thanks to Domenico Vaccaro. And while you're visiting the cloister, be sure and look up. There you'll see a remarkable collection of frescoes painted by an unknown artist in the 17th century. The subject matter ranges from religious figures on the bottom to allegories and virtues on the top.
The Church of Santa Chiara was closed the day we visited, but that's a perfect excuse to return to Naples once again. When you go to the store to buy broccoli, be like a detective. Remember how you always used to tell me? Yep. <laughs> so look at this beautiful head of broccoli. Mommy did a great job getting this. Look at how uniformly green this is. You see how tight these florets are? No yellow spots. If you see yellow spots, you know that's old broccoli. Yeah, right. Turn it over. Look at the stem. That's telltale, too. Mm -hmm. This should be nice and green. Look how beautiful mm -hmm. that is. So what do we do with this? Well, we cut it up into small florets like this. Or I should say you did this, Mom. Mm -hmm. And we blanched it just until a fork goes through it. You and want this still to have some crunch. And it stays green. And it stays green. You don't want to put this in cold water mm -hmm. because you want, in ice yeah. water rather, to, right. to shock it because mm -hmm. we want this warm. Right. So now we have the broccoli cooked. So now you're going to add some garlic, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So you want, uh, oh, depending on how you like it. You yeah. could do one clove of minced garlic, two cloves. While she's doing that, I'm going to add some salt mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. And this is a great salad. It's a little... A nice diversion from a classic insalata mista right. or a, yeah. you know, an insalata verde. And a little bit of pepper. And then you want to have some good extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. And the trick is to put it on while the broccoli is it's still warm. Because it's really going to seep into the broccoli and That's flavor right. it. So you, I'm just eyeballing this. But you want about, oh, a quarter of a cup of the extra virgin olive oil. Right. And mom, why don't you toss that, and then I'll tell them what else goes into this. And then with it, and this is a really healthy salad, you could add other things to this. But I know that you love chickpeas. Oh, I love chickpeas. You love chickpeas. Here's another spoon. Why don't you use two? Have, have, uh, it's got high protein. Right. And mm -hmm. it's filling, mm -hmm. and it's perfect with this, and it adds a nice other texture to it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mix that all up, mm -hmm. and then you add, oh, a can of chickpeas one 16-ounce can that you've drained and rinsed well. Right. That's about right, don't That's you right. think, Mom? Mm -hmm. And you toss all of that together. And then what I like with it, and I, th I know you do too, is I like sweet red onion with this. Oh, that goes off So just right. thin onion rings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After this, you have some breath mints ready, but mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't get the joke, Mom. Okay. What joke? <laughs> I you, said, you. after this, you have some breath mints ready you, you. because you've eaten onions. <laughs> Put your mind on the food, not on the joke. Okay, all right, okay. So we're putting in some little onion rings here. You just cut it up thinly. It gives mm -hmm. a really nice color yeah, yeah. to I the think, salad as well. Is that enough, you think? I think you ought to eat a little more oil. More oil, mm -hmm. sure, because the broccoli is going to absorb mm -hmm. that, so we're going to put a little bit more oil in there. Okay, that's fine. Okay, toss. Mm -hmm. And then also with it, you want to have a little bit of vinegar, or you could use lemon juice if you wanted to. So either a red wine vinegar, this happens to be a white vinegar. We're going to pour some of that on, not too much. Mm -hmm. Toss again. And it's best to let that marinate. Right. So you could make this early uh, in the day. The mm -hmm. trick is, remember, you want to put the dressing on while the broccoli is warm. Right. And if you wanted to give it additional heat, you could add some hot red pepper flakes. Oh, yes. Wouldn't that be good? That would be very good. That yes. would be good with it as well. Yeah. I'm going to add just a little bit more onion to that right. because I right. think it needs a little bit more color. Mm -hmm. Look at how easy this is. It's yeah. so simple. But that's the whole point of Italian food, isn't it? Right. Use the best ingredients mm -hmm. and keep the treatment simple. Here's a simple Sicilian pepper salad. You want to start with some garlic, and here's my trick for garlic when you have to mince it. Take a couple cloves, or whatever, however number you're using, and just sprinkle some salt over them. Then go shopping or something, come back 20 minutes later, and you'll be able to chop it. And you see what's happened here? If you look on my board, you see that liquid that's been coming out of the garlic that I chopped after I had the salt on it. So now it makes it almost creamy. See, almost creamy. And that's going to blend very well with this salad. So there is a tip on garlic. So once we have that, I'm going to put the garlic right here now because I have to do something else. But you see that water that came out of there just from adding salt to two cloves of garlic. So for this salad, I said it's Sicilian, and that means mint. Yes. 
So here we have some fresh mint leaves. And all we want to do is mince those with that garlic. This is just a nice refreshing salad in the summer. And all we did for, to the peppers was char them like we did for the pepperonata and the stuffed peppers. Took the skins off and then cut them into strips. See, so there they are. So you can use a variety of peppers, yellow, red, green, whatever you would like. And then this simple, simple dressing is really going to make those peppers sing. And I especially like this on a really hot day when you don't want to heat up the oven too much. So I would do the peppers on the grill for, in this case. And then I, I make this early in the day because if you let the flavors mingle somewhat, really, really better. Then you get some crusty Sicilian bread, some semolina bread, or you get a ciabatta and you mop up the juices of the salad with the bread. So there's our combo of garlic and mint. And that's going to go right in there. In it goes. And I'm not going to give it too much more salt because there's salt on that garlic. I'll just do a little. And then we want some extra virgin olive oil. Toss those peppers with all this mixture. Beautiful. And then, because in Sicily, one of the underlying flavors is something called agrodolce, sour and sweet at the same time, we want to add the sweetness part. And the sweetness part could be just red wine vinegar, white balsamic vinegar, or let me make a royal room for this because I was telling you about the peppers I did earlier from Naples. You see, I went to the Cantina del Vesuvio and I bought this special red wine vinegar. It's very, very syrupy. So just because you're here, and this is my prized vinegar, I don't use this for everybody, I'm just going to do a little syrupy dollop of this vinegar. You don't need much because it's very, very concentrated. And that's the sweet part. So this is Sicilian pepper salad with mint and garlic and Marianne's prized vinegar from Vesuvio. We have chocolate lava cake. Lava cake, ma, lava cake. Non è tradizionale. Non, non è, è tradizionale no, no. italiano. No, no. So this is something that you can find un ottimo find dessert. And look at that arm action. <laughs> okay. okay. Now we have those gorgeous eggs and egg yolks, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we're going to put this in? Yeah, please. All right. Okay. Close in. We have to be all one cream. So you get this nice and smooth. And remember, butter in Italy is always unsalted. Always. So the Perfect. heavy cream goes in. Okay. <clears throat> That's going to give a nice texture to this, right? Exactly. Beautiful. And what do you serve the lava cake with? What, what do you have something to go with it? We can serve with the fresh fruits like strawberry or yeah. something like ice cream, mm. whipping cream. Okay. The cocoa. Cocoa and, um, and flour. And flour. Zero, zero. Just a little bit of flour in there. Yeah, it's 100 grams of cocoa for 50 of okay. uh, Flour. Okay, so there it is. And the most important part of this are the little ramekins that you're going to bake them in. You see what he did? He floured them really well and he buttered and floured them really well. You want to get into all those little grooves. This is about four ounces, I would say. You can find these in a grocery store. If you want to do them in a, a porcelain ramekin, you could do that as well. But this everybody can find. Mm. 
אוקיי. אוקיי. אוקיי, אני אוהב את הבוא, אבל אני לא אעשה את זה. אוקיי. 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 Our chocolate lava cake is ready. Mm -hmm. Now we have just to put on the plate like this. See how easy that came out? And that's because he buttered and floured them really and well. Just a bit of ancient sugar. Wow. That's okay. It. Shall we eat? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You have to try. We have to try. We should cut it, right? To yeah. see what that looks like inside. And that's why it's lava. called lava. I came up with this idea when I had nothing else to do and I thought, how about if everything was up red? So, here is the Lola Arosa. Isn't it beautiful? It's got that nice crinkly looking edge. Look at this. He brings it in on the root for me, see? And it's all been washed. I'm going to take just some of that off. And really fresh lettuce is just so crispy. You can hear it just crackle like that, see? I'm just going to tear some into a bowl. You really shouldn't ever cut lettuce with a knife. You should really just tear it. So Lola Arosa. You can get the seeds for this from Italian companies in the United States. So there's our Lola Arosa. And then if you don't have that, you can always make your salad red by using radicchio. This is radicchio. You can find radicchio in the store. So you put a little bit of that in. Staying with that red theme. Okay. Italians usually eat their salads after they eat their main meal. That's the traditional way to do it. So now we have Lola Arosa, we have Aradicchio, and I don't know if you ever saw that show that I did from Treviso where we went to a Radicchio farm. And then we have, what's next for red? Yes, we have, let me put this over here, radishes. Of course we do. And these are guys from his garden. Look at how beautiful the tops are. These tops you can use in cooking. Put them in soup. You could make a salad out of them, but they're not red. So I'm going to put them over to the side and just work with the radish part. So radishes, if you're getting them out of your garden, you really want to get them when they're small. They taste better. They're not woodsy. When you let them go, they get to be very, very woodsy. So the red part of this salad comes from the outer skin of the, uh, the radish. I also grew something called watermelon radish, but unfortunately it didn't do so well, so I didn't have them ready for you when I, when I was making this salad. So put in two, two radishes, two young radishes. Red onion. And then we have red lentils. Well, they're quasi-red, but they're called red lentils. And lentils are legumes. They're very good for you, very high in protein. You can get them in different colors. They come in brown, they come green, they come black. These are red lentils that we cooked to get 3 quarters of a cup. And here they are when they're cooked. They're not exactly red, but we can fudge it. So in they go. This is going to be a very healthy salad, the red lentils. And then we want some mint. So here's some fresh mint. This is to give added flavor to this. So fresh mint from the garden. We just want to mince that up. And usually Italian salads are dressed very simply with extra virgin olive oil with red wine vinegar or with lemon juice, fresh lemon juice. There's none of these bottled dressings. Those things just don't exist in Italian cooking. So that's the mint and that goes in. And now we have to work with the beets. Dice them. Okay. 
And so four beats would be enough for this salad, I think. The beat goes on and the beats go in. Okay, there are our beats. And we're just going to toss this around gently. How pretty this is. Red salad. Oh. So now we have to think about a dressing for this. And a good red wine vinegar. Here's a treat for you. Look at this vinegar. This is homemade. I mean, you can use any red wine vinegar. But this was made by a friend of mine in Reggio Emilia. He makes his own vinegar. He cures his own prosciutto. So you want about a couple tablespoons of that. And the mother is still in there. And I'll tell you, I wish you could be here to smell that. It's really, really strong. So you make a little emulsion. And you pour this over your salad. Get that all really well, well blended. You pour it over that salad. Oh, I'll tell you, salads from the garden, you can't beat it. And you give this a nice toss. Give it a nice toss. And when we're ready to serve this, we're going to put it on a really pretty looking dish. So that's how you do red salad. Because we're going to be making a big minestrone soup. And when you think about it, the word minestrone means that, just big soup. Because this is a soup that has a lot of different vegetables in it. And I'm going to start with some onions and a little bit of olive oil. So you want to get, oh, about three tablespoons of olive oil. Now, here's two carrots that I have just chopped up. And then I'm going to add some leeks. And now I like to use leeks in soup, but by no means are you limited to the vegetables I'm using today because minestrone is something that comes from the creativity of your mind and you can use just about any kind of vegetable that you have. Now this is a leek. That's potty in Italian and I'm only going to use the white part. And did you know that leeks are members of the onion family? And sometimes they're very dirty, and I don't think people like to use leeks very often because they don't know what to do with them. Now, you see, that looks fairly clean, so I don't even have to wash this. So all I have to do is chop this. And what I want are two leeks. So there's one. I'm going to put that right in with my onions. And here's a little bit more. So now I have two leeks in there with my onions. And I want to stir that around a little bit and get that going. And now what I'm doing here is I'm making something the Italians call a sofrito. I'm frying up the vegetables in a little bit of oil sort of to exude their flavor and get those vegetables soft a little bit. So now I can put in my carrots so they go in. And then I want to put in, oh, some celery. So here I've got just two stalks of celery that I've chopped up and they can go in. And now if you want to put these vegetables in in a dice, you can do that. You can make them even smaller because then they'll cook in the broth a lot faster. So now I can turn my heat up a little bit and let that cook a little bit. Now, to this I'm going to be adding other things. Now I've got some potatoes and here they are diced up in water. Now I have to drain those because I don't want that water. So I want to drain the water off. See, just like that. And then I'm going to have to dry these because I don't want that water on my, on my potatoes when I put them in the olive oil. Let me get rid of that. Just dry them off. And now this is a wonderful thing to have in the winter time, of course, the minestrone soup. But, and so we're going to be adding a little bit of basil to this soup, but not immediately. But we have to start the process a little bit, you see. So I want to get my basil leaves out there so you can just look at those and try to smell them. And I'm going to be making a sauce with that. Now while my vegetables are cooking, I should tell you we have to do one other thing. We have to put some beans in. And here I've got some, oh, just navy beans, but you could use cannellini beans or, or white kidney beans. And what you want to do is soak, oh, about a cup of them in cold water, just like that. Let them stay overnight. And then the next day, they'll plump up some. And then you're going to want to cook them, drain off that water, get out some cold water, put them in a pot, and cook them until they're not quite done. You want them to be 
it's still hard, al dente, because you're going to be putting these back in the soup. So they're still a little bit al dente, but those are ready to go in. So I can put those in. In they go, the beans. And now, one other thing, I've got to put in eggplant. And here I've got a nice big fat eggplant that I've just diced up, took the skin off. In that goes. So now you can start to see this is going to become a very big soup. Now I just want that to cook down a little bit and I'm going to come back to that. Now what about the basil? Well, <sighs> this is a mortar and this is a pestle. And then you want to add a little bit of coarse salt, you see? And then you want to add a clove of fresh garlic. So I'm just going to chop that up a little bit because that's a big clove of garlic. And now you get that in and then you get into this. And I mean you've got to stand here now and pound this down. And what you want to do is get these leaves into a pulp. Some chicken broth. And that looks good. And I'm using homemade chicken broth. And this is about two cups. And you want it hot when it goes in so it doesn't reduce the heat of the, of the uh, vegetables in the pot. So two cups of homemade chicken broth. And if you have to use canned, I'm not even going to answer that one. And in go four cups of boiling water. And then you want to add, oh, just a little bit of salt and pepper. And that's all going to cook down very nicely. So let me bring that over. So now a little bit of, I like to use coarse salt. I just think that gives a much nicer flavor. Did you know there are more nutrients in coarse salt than there is in regular? And some coarse black pepper. And that looks very good already. And now I want to add, oh, tomatoes. I almost forgot. That gives it a nice color. So, oh, you want a couple of tomatoes. And sometimes I use, well, I like to, to use plum tomatoes. I prefer to use plum tomatoes as opposed to beefsteak. But I'm on a budget today, and I don't have plum tomatoes. So I'm using these. But this is a big soup, so we can't help it if we're a little messy. And the rest of that, and I think I can pick this up and throw it in, and this one, and this one. You didn't even see that, did you? OK, and now i got to wipe my hands. And now I think I can add my other vegetables, because there's still more to put in this soup, because this is still a big soup. So here I've got, oh, a cup and a half of cabbage. And really, if you're making a minestrone, one of the things that's important to put in it are green types of vegetables. So that's why that's going in. And of course, every kid loves spinach. So we've got about a cup and a half of spinach. And of course, you see, I'm putting these in last now because they're not going to take as long to cook. And here's some zucchini that's been diced up small. That's another cup and a half. So in that goes. So then give that a nice stir. Stir that around. And now with these added vegetables, this is probably going to take not too much longer to cook because they're going to cook down rather quickly. And you see how beautiful this is starting to look now. And here I've got, oh, vermicelli. And now you can use this or you could use something called stelline, which are little stars. You could use a tubular pasta if you wanted, a ditalini. And you put this in raw and you just want to break the pasta up, you see? in small pieces like that. And the reason that you do that is you want that to cook in the same amount of time that it's going to take that, those vegetables that you just added to, uh, to the cooking pot to cook. So you want all this to cook about the same time. And you don't want the pasta to be mushy. In Italian cooking, pasta should be al dente. So now mix that up well. And if you see that your soup is maybe a little too thick, you could always add a little extra broth to this. But I don't think mine needs it. So now the cover goes back on that, and that's cooking. And now to finish off the pesto, you've got to add cheese to this. So now to do that, you want to grate up some cheese. And now you can use either Romano totally, or you can use Romano and Parmesan cheese. And you want to owe about three tablespoons. Bring over your other cheese. Here's my Romano. And now what you want to do is start adding some of the cheese, a little bit of the uh, Parmesan, a little bit of the Romano, and work that in. Here are my 
pine nuts, and you want, oh, about three tablespoons of those. So in they go. And you continue to use your pestle to get this all incorporated, you see. You want to add some extra virgin olive oil. And you do that, oh, a little bit at a time. You probably want a half in a cup of extra virgin olive oil for the one and a half cups of packed leaves that uh, I started out with. So continue on like this. You see, and now it's starting to get there, but it isn't there yet. So let me show you what a finished one would look like. Here's one that's done. And you see, let me get a clean spoon here. When you let pesto sit around, it starts to get a little brown on top, you see. But look at that beautiful color. And now that sauce is all ready to use. And I'm just going to give that a little taste test myself. Definitely tastes like pesto to me. Wonderful flavor of basil leaves. So now, let me see what my soup is doing, because I think that that's just about ready. Yep, I think this may be ready. Let me just check it and see. Yes, my pasta is nicely cooked. So now it's time for the kingly touch, because that's what basil means. And I'm going to put three heaping tablespoons in that. And that's what gives it its Genovese character.